Well, good morning, Grace. Uh, welcome to those of you that are with us, but also welcome to those who are watching online. We're glad to have you all part of the body here at Grace Brethren Church of Clinton. Um, this is the day that the Lord has created. He has made this day. We must rejoice and be glad in it. Um, we need to be making sure that we keep that at the forefront of our minds in the coming days, months, and weeks ahead. Uh, let's open our service this morning with a word of prayer. Lord, thank you for today. Thank you for this day that you have made and you have destined to be today. Lord, we ask that you would help us relish in today, help us to worship you. Take this time to really focus in on who you are. We thank you, Lord, for your timing, for your provision, and for your grace in our lives. We ask that you would help us to cling to those things and help us to know that you are a sovereign God who is in control of all. We ask that this morning we would give honor and glory to your name, and we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So just uh, some quick announcements and things that you need to know going forward. Uh, just so quickly, uh, this week uh, on Tuesdays we have a pretty packed day of, of ministry opportunities. Uh, at 10 a.m. we have our Grace Fit classes, um, and at, at 1 p.m. we have a time of prayer uh, that if you have a prayer request, we just ask that that gets turned into our church email by at least noon so that we can pass that along uh, to the group that prays. And then at 6 p.m. on Tuesdays, we also have another Grace Fit session, so whether it works for you in the morning or in the evening, you can join in in that. On Wednesday night, we also have Wednesday night Bible study, which is via Zoom, and we would love to have you join us for that. Um, be sure that if you're thinking of coming back to church on a Sunday, uh, make sure that you go on our YouTube channel. It's youtube.com slash Clinton Grace, and you can watch a pre-flight video, basically, you know, showing you how to come in the building, how to interact in the building, um, and go through those things. Um, that'll maybe help make your decision a little bit better um, and help you uh, come join us. Um, be sure to stay connected with us on social media, with Facebook and Instagram, but also our YouTube channel. Um, you can catch all the messages and special messages through that. Um, some bigger things that are coming up is our VBS. It's virtual VBS. Um, this week we're going to be trying to put some boxes together and... Uh, we actually have home kits for people to um, reserve online. If you go to our website, clintongrace.org, you can click there and reserve a kit for your family. Um, we're, we're at, we only have 100 boxes, so it's limited quantity, but we're already at like 25. Um, so we're really happy about that and looking forward to uh, reaching out to families um, that aren't necessarily just in our community or associated with our church, but there's, there's names that I don't recognize on that list. So that's a really positive thing. Um, and we haven't even put a banner out on the yard yet. So we're hoping that that's going to be a really big outreach for us. Um, there's door hangers for VBS on your way out this morning. I'm not going to be there, but if you can grab a few and take them to your neighborhood um, and recruit ki kids and families into VBS, that'd be really great. Uh, last but not least, for sure, is today is a day where we're going to have a special offering uh, that's going to be going towards the church at the well, and we're trying to help build the well. We're trying to help um, Dane and Anna and their family and their, and their core team really get established and started in Towson. So if you would like to do something today, if you have a check, on the, uh, make it out to Grace Brethren Church, and then make sure on the memo line that you write something about the church at the well or church plant, church in Towson. That would really be great. Um, you can also, if you give on PayPal electronically, there is a drop-down arrow there that you can give directly to Church at the Well through that as well. So without further ado, we're going to transition now to a time of worship, and we are so glad that we get to worship with you all this morning. Good morning, Grace family. It's a, a wonderful thing to see your faces this morning, and it's always a good time to praise the Lord. So at this time, we just ask that you center your minds and you center your hearts and you center your spirits as we worship the Lord this morning with praise and song.
talking about um, in the series a little bit and just just a topic of things that have been talked about and Pastor Clark mentioned something I don't know if you guys paid attention to the panel um, but Pastor Clark mentioned something about how in order for us to be able to make a change we have to change our heart and we have to make sure our heart is right and um, that we are in line with what God has for us so this song is just talking about giving your everything, giving your love, your all, yourself to Jesus Christ. And in order to make a difference, in order to grow um, in this thing we call life, in order to be salt and light in the world, we have to make sure that our heart is connected to the heart of Christ. Amen. So I hope that you enjoy this. And if you know this song, you want to lift your hands and you want to sing behind your mask with us, that is perfectly okay.
pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much just for the opportunity to be together. Lord, we thank you for those who are able to be here in the sanctuary with us this morning. We thank you so much for the technology that allows those at home to also be tuned in today. And we just thank you for your church and the fact that even in hard times that doesn't cease to be your church. And we ask, Lord, today that um, you'll be glorified in our midst. We ask, Lord, as we look into your word, that your word will convict us, will change us, and help us to be more like Jesus. And we just ask that you'll be glorified in everything that's said and done here. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Good morning. Good morning. That's a little bit awkward for me. I have not been in this pulpit since February. Um, it's a little bit of a different feeling, but so glad to see you all here. Uh, and thinking about, I haven't been in this pulpit since February, how much things have changed since February and all the things that I've learned since February. I've learned how to properly wear a mask. Um, a true story, I was wearing one of my masks upside down for a while. Someone had to correct me, and I appreciate that. I also have learned how to sneeze in a mask, which is good, and how to find a new mask after you sneeze in a mask. Um, but it's been, it's been a kind of a crazy time, and it, we've had a lot of things piling on us over the last couple months as we talk about the pandemic and the other things that have been happening in the news. And I was thinking about a week or two ago, I was watching the news, and by the way, I've decided I'm not going to watch as much news. Um, I've also decided I'm not going to spend as much time on social media as I was a couple weeks ago. But as I was on social media and as I was on the news, I got to thinking one night, this is a really dark time. I, I thought we're... 
we're look, I'm looking around like the world is a dark place right now. And I'm hearing people say, well, it's the most divided we've ever been. And every time somebody says that to me, I remind them as politely as I can, we did once fight a civil war. So while we're divided right now, it's not the most divided time we've ever been, but let's pray that we can have some unity in our nation and our churches as we move forward. But as I'm looking around, I'm thinking, you know what, the world is really dark right now. It struck me, right now is not the right term. When I say the world is really dark right now, you know what? The world's not dark right now. The world has always been dark. One of the things I think we need to remember is from the fall of Adam, since the day that Adam ate that piece of fruit, the world has been under the bondage of the evil one. And the people living in the world have been caught in that bondage of the evil one. And as a result, since the Garden of Eden, the world has been in a dark place. And that's why Jesus came. That's why Jesus came in order to shine the light, in order to, to free us from the bondage of Satan. But also, the other thought that hit me right after, right now is not the right word, was, well, that's why you're here, Jack. And that's why we're here. Because what does the Bible say about the church? The Bible says to us, Jesus said to us, you are the light of the world. And so when I was watching the news and thinking, wow, this world's really a dark place, one of the things I thought was, well, this is why I'm here. This is what I'm supposed to be here for. I'm supposed to be shining light. And the church is supposed to be shining light. And we're supposed to be lighting the dark world around us for Christ. And then that, of course, brings up the follow-up question. How are we doing with that? You know, and that's not, an accu that's not an accusatory question at all. That's an honest question. How are we doing? And then, then that should drive us to the next question. How can we do better? How can we do a better job living in a world that's, that's engulfed in darkness at times? How can we do a better job of being the light that Christ has called us to be? And the reason I think that's really important is the passage we're looking at today, Paul is instructing the Philippians, and he's telling them, basically, how to live as lights how to shine as lights in the world they were because you know what even in the first century in Philippi the world was a dark place and Paul was telling them live as lights shine as lights and I really like the passage we're looking at today we're in Philippians chapter 2 verses 12 through 18 if you'd like to turn there with me and in Philippians 2 verses 12 through 18 Paul is giving instructions now I want to remind you again of the context Paul is in prison He's got this church that he helped found that he's concerned about, so he's writing these fa this fatherly letter to them to instruct them on how to live their faith and how to glorify God in the place that they're in. And yes, at times they're facing some persecution. And so he's trying to remind them of how they can live their faith. And so in that context, this is what Paul writes to them. It says, Therefore, my beloved, as you've always obeyed, so now not only is in my presence but much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Do all things without grumbling or disputing, that you may be blameless, blameless and innocent children of God, without blemish in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation among whom you shine as lights in the world, holding fast to the word of life, so in the day of Christ I may be, I may be proud that I did not run in vain or labor in vain, even if I am to be poured out as a drink offering upon the sacrificial offering of your faith, I am glad and rejoice with you. Likewise, you also should be glad and rejoice with me. So Paul is reminding them, he's giving them instruction on how they can live their faith and how they can shine as lights, which is kind of the theme of the passage. But I want you to notice he kind of breaks this passage down in an interesting way. He starts out by giving them a couple of commands. And we're going to go through those commands here in just a moment. And then he goes from the commands to what those commands are going to look like if we're living out those commands. And then he kind of gives us some instructions on why those commands are important. So let's first start off with these two commands that he gives us. He says to the Philippians, he says, continue in obedience, even now in my absence as you were in my presence. And he's saying to them, listen, you've always been obedient when I was there you were obedient. And now that I'm not there anymore, continue in your obedience. Now, I want to make a couple things uh, clear real quick. First off, Paul's not here talking about obedience to Paul. He's not talking about Paul and Paul being there as a taskmaster saying, you know, just because I'm not here doesn't mean you don't have to listen to me anymore. What he's reminding them is this. He's reminding them that just as you have obeyed Christ in my presence, continue to obey Christ in my absence. 
Paul, when Paul called people to obedience, it's interesting, in 1 Corinthians, when he called them to obedience, he didn't say, hey, guys, listen to me. He said, follow me as I follow Christ Jesus. And that's kind of the command that he's given them now. Continue to follow after Jesus just the way that you've seen me follow after Jesus. Don't stop just because I'm not there watching you. Continue to follow after Jesus. Another thing I think is important is Paul's not calling them to a legalistic obedience to a set of rules. One of the things I think that people, they read this and say, oh, well, Paul says to obey, so there must be a list of rules somewhere that we need to follow. What's interesting is Paul goes through the world preaching the gospel. Almost everywhere he went, he actually reduced the number of rules people were trying to follow rather than increase them. Wherever he went, he came into conflict with the Judaizers who said, you have to do this, this, and this to be a Christian. He said, no, no, you have to accept Jesus Christ as your Savior, and you have to follow these moral commands. That's all we're holding you up against. Okay? The reason that's important is because often we fall into this idea that keeping a set of rules is what it means to be obedient to God. That's not what God has called us to. That's what the Pharisees called people to. They said, here's this list of 300-some rules. Memorize them and obey every one of them. But when Paul calls us to obedience, what he's really saying is, follow after Jesus. And on a lot of levels, it would be a lot simpler if we had a list of rules that we were expected to follow. But instead he says, you follow after the God who has saved you. Follow after Jesus. Live his example. So he calls him to obedience. He continues. He says, continue to obey in my absence just as you've been obeying in my presence. And actually the obedience that he's calling us to, to get a picture of what he's asking us for, go back to the previous chapter, the previous couple verses where Paul is describing the obedience of Jesus Christ. Where it says that Jesus was obedient to the Father, even to the point of death, death on a cross. And that's what Paul's calling us to. He says, follow Jesus wherever he leads you, even if it leads you to a cross. So first command is obedience. Now, I think most of us can get our heads wrapped around the idea that we're to continue being obedient. And we're, if we're going to be the light in the world that we're called to be, we have to be obedient to Christ. But the next command here is where people get a little bit sideways. Command number two says, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who works in you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Now, I want to spend a minute on this command. And the reason I want to spend a minute on this command is because people have misconstrued this command so badly that they've fallen into heresy. What does it mean to work out your salvation? Uh, I think sometimes it's easier to understand things by understanding what they don't mean. So let's talk about what it doesn't mean. First thing it doesn't mean, it's not about working for our salvation. I've come across some people who take this past and say, well, listen, we have to work out our salvation, so there's something we have to do to earn our salvation. There's nothing we can do or should be doing to try to earn our salvation. Ephesians 2, 8, 9 tells us we're saved by grace through faith. That's, all, that's the only thing that can save us. There's nothing else that can save us. And so we can't get caught up in this idea of working for our salvation. One of the things that I have to remind myself every time I get caught up in this idea of work salvation, by the way, Work salvation is kind of our natural default. We easily fall back into the idea that I've got to earn something from God. Um, whenever I start to fall back into that, I have to remind myself of something. In my natural state, I'm a degenerate, helpless sinner. Not only am I unable to help myself, I am uninterested in helping myself. And so without the grace and mercy of God, I could not be saved. So with that being understood, we know that Paul here cannot be saying, hey, Work out your own salvation. You've got to figure it out. Find a way to earn your salvation. I've heard some other people, and this is actually the type of church that I grew up in, that said, yeah, yeah, you know, God has saved us by his grace, and he's brought us into his, into his family by his grace. But now that we're in the family, we've got to work to hold on to our salvation. Maybe some of you have heard that somewhere where, okay, yeah, you know, you were saved by grace, but if you, don't do, if you don't do things right, you could lose that salvation. I want to make very clear here, that's a heresy from the pit of hell. And I want to explain to you why. If I couldn't earn my salvation, I can't hold on to my salvation. If my salvation is by grace, then I can't hold on to my salvation by works, right? I can't suddenly switch from grace to works once I'm saved. As a matter of fact, not only is it impossible logically, it's impossible according to Scripture. Because when Jesus was talking about his people, this is what he said in John chapter 10. 
And if you struggle with the idea of loss of salvation, I'd, I'd recommend that you read John 10, verses 27 through 30, and highlight in your Bible. But Jesus says here, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. I give them eternal life, and they will never perish. And no one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. I and the Father are one. Now here's what Jesus says to the disciples. At the time where he saves us, he places us in his hands, and he says, nobody's snatching you out of my hand. And encompassed around my hands are the hands of my Father, and nobody's snatching you out of my Father's hands. Now who's doing the holding on? Not me. My grip's not strong enough. But since the Father and the Son are holding us in their hands, all of the work of salvation is done by God. He calls us to himself. He saves us by his grace. And nothing in this passage should ever be misconstrued to suggest that we either have to earn our salvation or we have to work to hold on to our salvation. Praise God, he saved me by his grace. Praise God, he's going to hold me by his grace my command is to continue to live in obedience while I'm being held in his grace. So if, if it's not about working for our salvation, what is it about? Well, it's interesting. Paul says, continue to work out your salvation. It's not about earning salvation. What he's actually telling us to do here, he's saying, listen, you know that God has done a work in your heart. God has done something special. He has brought you to a point of salvation. And here's the thing. In God's eyes, we've been sanctified. In God's eyes, we've been made holy. When God looks at us, he sees Jesus. That's the fact of life for, for God. Paul is saying to us, start to live a life that mirrors on the outside what God has already done on the inside. It's not about earning. It's not about holding on to. It's about taking the work that God has already done and fleshing it out and living it in our lives on a day-to-day -day basis so that the world around us can see what is happening inside of us. That makes sense, guys? You tracking with me here? Okay. It's not about earning or keeping. It's about living out what's already in there. And as a matter of fact, that's there in the passage because Paul says that it's God who works in you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. It says, you work out your salvation, you live it out, you flesh it out, you let people see what's happening. Why? Because the God of the universe is the one who did this work in you. And now he's calling you to live it out. And by the way, when he says here that God is the one who works and wills for his good pleasure, he's reminding us of two things. One, God does all the heavy lifting in our salvation. And two, the God of the universe is at work in you. And we should take very seriously the idea that we need to live that out. Because the omniscient, omnipotent, all-powerful God of the universe is saying to you, I've done something and now I'm commanding you to live this out. We should approach our lives with reverence because of the fact that it's actually God who's done the work in us. And what's amazing is, if we fall into the trap of working for our salvation, we live in our lives in fear. If we understand that God has done the work, we live our lives in reverence. And we live our lives with fear and trembling, not of judgment, but just fear and trembling of the awesomeness of the God that we serve. See, when we understand who's doing all the work, we really get a better view of him, and we're really more impressed and more apt to actually live out the life that God's called us to do. So the commands are continue in obedience, and while you're continuing in obedience, work out your salvation meaning letting it get out from inside to the outside. And then Paul says, now let me help you understand what that looks like. And he gives us two examples of what, look, of what that looks like. And it says uh, in verse 15 and 16, it says, Do all things without grumbling or disputing, that you may be blameless and innocent children of God, without blemish, in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation among whom you shine as lights in the world. All right. That's where Paul goes from preaching to meddling. He, 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 he gets really personal with us here. He says, listen, um, if you want to live as lights in the world, step one, do all things without grumbling and disputing, or do th all things without grumbling and complaining. 
And I was reading this, and I, I, I read a comment here, and I thought he summed it up so well. He said, your first response should be, your first response naturally is really all things? I have to do all things without grumbling and complaining? Because, you know, sometimes there are things in our minds that we feel like that should be okay to grumble about. How many of you have ever been to the MVA? In our natural state, we feel like, hey, that should be something we can grumble about. Um, you know, I can, I can list all kinds of things that we might feel uncomfortable grumbling about. Um, one of the things we need to understand, in our natural state, grumbling is actually our native tongue. Any of you know more than one language? I know two. I know English and grumbling. And I think I learned grumbling first. Naturally, as, as human beings, we tend to grumble. Why? Because we're dissatisfied. Why? Because we're sinful. All kinds of things. And Paul says, listen, that native tongue, you have to get rid of that. We have to do all things without grumbling and complaining. That's really hard. That's like right there, right on the line of feeling like it's impossible. And you know it would be, except for the God of the universe is the one who's working in me to make it possible. But he says, if you want to live as lights in this world, you have to do all things without grumbling and complaining. And I want to, I want to kind of remind us here, I, I, I'm not going to lie to you. Like I said, grumbling is my native tongue. Um, the last several months, it's been really easy to grumble. Okay? It's been really easy to just give in to the grumble monster and just grumble all the time. And I've been convicted that that's something that I've got to keep an eye on, it, obviously looking at this passage. But I was thinking this is something we're probably all struggling with right now because right now we're living in like the perfect grumble incubator. We've got all kinds of bad things happening around us. We're isolated from one another. And so rather than having conversations with each other, we're communicating via social media or some other method, or worse yet, we're having arguments in our head. Anybody else having arguments in their head in the last couple of months? Nobody else. I'm crazy. All right. Um, Sometimes the voices talk back. Here, here's, here's the thing. I am undefeated in arguments in my head. And so when I, when I have a discussion in my head, it's so easy for me to justify my grumbling. And you know, I'm looking around. I'm thinking of things that we grumble about right now. We're grumbling about, we grumble about having to wear masks. Then we grumble about the people that don't wear their masks the right way. Um, we grumble about uh, the different isolation we're under, and then we grumble about why people aren't obeying the isolation. You know, we grumble on both sides of every issue. We grumble about our brothers and sisters that we see online or that we see doing something else, and we're not having conversations, and as a result, we're just feeding this grumbling, this grumbling, this grumbling. And Paul says, if you want to live as a light in this world for Jesus Christ, you have to do all things without grumbling or complaining. We need to understand, and how do we get our handle on this? A couple things I've been thinking about how to get a handle on the grumbling. First is this. By the way, this, this command actually uh, bridges over both interpersonal relationships and people-God relationships. And also we take this passage and all we really talk about is, well, we need to stop grumbling, we need to stop fighting with each other. One of the things I think we need to wrap our heads around is all grumbling is actually against God. Sometimes we feel like we're justified because we're grumbling against someone, and this is how it works in my head. I feel like I'm justified to grumble against someone, but I don't stop and say, you know what? This grumbling is actually a complaint against the God of the universe who's placed me in this situation. If we want to get a victory over grumbling, one of the things we have to get our heads around is that God is in total control of our circumstances. What that means is he's placed us here. He's causing us to live through these circumstances. He's also promised us, since he's in control of these circumstances, that he's going to work them out for our good. And here's the thing that really hurts your head when you think about it. Even the person who's aggravating you, even the person who you're tempted to grumble against, God has placed them in your life, and he has control over that as well. So before we grumble, we need to stop and ask, you know, what is God trying to do in this situation? The other thing I've been convicted to do is this i got to learn to stop feeding my grumbles. You know, there are certain things that, you, that frustrate you, that you grumble about, and you have certain people you can go talk to, and you guys can grumble together and encourage one another. And I've had to a couple times recently say, you know what, I, I've got to stop talking about this issue because it's causing a grumbling spirit. But we need to understand that grumbling and complaining 
is not what God has called us to be. He says, if you're going to live out your salvation, if you're going to work out the salvation I place in your heart, step one is this. Do all things without grumbling and complaining. And we're going to come back to why that's important here in just a second. The next thing he says, um, not only living without grumbling and complaining, but he says also holding fast to the word of life so that in the day of Christ I may be proud that I did not run in vain or labor in vain. Paul says if you're going to work out your salvation, if you're going to do things, all things in obedience, first, don't grumble and complain. Second, hold fast to the word of life. Hold fast to the word of life. What does that mean? That means we've got to grab onto God's word. If we're going to live in a way that we can be lights for this world, we've got to grab onto God's, world and we, God's word and hold onto it with all of our might. Because here's the thing. There is nowhere else in the world that we as believers of Jesus Christ can learn how to follow him than in his word, right? There's nothing else that's going to give us guidance. As a matter of fact, we also say that God's word is our guide to all faith and practice. But here's the problem. The word gives us wisdom on how to deal with the issues of the day. The word gives us wisdom on how to deal with our, our different struggles and our different grumbling. The, world, the word gives us wisdom on how we can glorify God with our lives. But the problem is most of us don't even take the time to open the word of God to see what's in it. And instead, what happens is we often get this facade of a Christian worldview where we say, well, I'm a Christian, but if we really dig in a little bit deeper, what we'll find out is where we're really getting programmed from is from the world all around us. And we've been challenged a lot lately about some of the things the church has gotten wrong over history. And you know what? The church has gotten wrong a lot of things throughout history. What I would point out is every time the church has made a mistake in history, it's not been because they held too tightly to the Word of God. It's because they got captured by the culture in which they were living. And we need to be on guard because, again, we're living in a dark time. Paul, in his time, calls them a crooked and perverse generation. And I think that sits just fine in our era. But unfortunately, if we're not careful, we're actually looking to the crooked and perverse generation out there to tell us how we should live. So that if you want to live as lights in this world, then you need to get a hold of the word of life and you need to hold on to it for all you've got. What that means is you've got to know what it says. You've got to know what it calls you to do and you've got to be living those things out in your life. The shame is that um, we're letting the culture a lot of times tell us what to do. And by the way, that's not something the church has only done in history. That's something the church is doing now. We allow the world around us to tell us what we should do. And the shame is they have no idea what they're doing. And we're letting them drive our bus as well. We need to hold on to the word of life. And when we hold on to the word of life, we'll be able to live as lights in this world. So Paul says, all right, this is what it looks like. You're going to hold on to the word of life, and you're going to live without grumbling and complaining. And then, and I kind of cut this up a little bit different, but I want you to see why it's important. Each of these calls are tied into some reason why it's important. For grumbling and complaining, he says, do everything without grumbling and complaining that you may be blameless and innocent children of God without blemish in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation among whom you shine as lights in the world. You know why it's so important for us to do things without grumbling and complaining? Because we're called to be lights in the world. What that means is we're called in this, in this sea of darkness, we're called to be this speck of light that points people towards Jesus. And he says, you know what? You can't be the light that you're supposed to be if you're characterized by grumbling and complaining. How many of you ever sh uh, shared the gospel with the four spiritual laws? You guys familiar with this four spiritual laws? Four spiritual laws starts with God loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life. I believe that. Do you believe that? Let me ask you a question. If you're trying to share the gospel with an unbeliever and you're characterized by grumbling and complaining, you're always the guy who's in a bad mood, and you start out by saying, hey, let me tell you about my Jesus. He loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life. What's their response going to be? Hey, dude, you don't seem like you like your plan very much. Why would I get involved in this? Listen, he says, 
live without complaining and without, um, without murmuring because you're called to be a light. A complaining spirit will actually turn off the world from God. Now, I said before, this command also, also deals with, uh, with interpersonal relationships, not only our attitude towards God's uh, gifts to us, but also towards interpersonal relationships. Think about this. When the world is watching the church, and the church is characterized by bickering, complaining, and grumbling, does that make the world want to listen to anything the church has to say? Now listen, that doesn't mean we always agree on everything. But there are a couple of things we need to remember. One of the things that's important is our unity, our love for one another are the marks that God has given us to live out our faith in order to draw people to him. And Pastor Clark mentioned a couple weeks ago, and I've, I've mentioned it before as well, one of the things I think we need to be really careful of is we need to understand that this is a family. And as we're dealing with each other, we might have disagreements, but one of the things that's really important is we don't air the family's dirty laundry out in front of the whole world. I remember one time I was having a conversation with someone online. I say conversation. It was an argument. Um, and he, he was another brother in Christ, and we were having a disagreement, and it struck me. We're on social media. We're having a disagreement, and it was over a theological issue. And it struck me, no unbeliever is going to see anything positive in this conversation. And so we took it offline because the world was watching. We need to be wise in how we interact with one another. And today, with social media, we have so many opportunities to blow up our brother and sister in Christ. I understand that every time that we do that to each other, we're not only dealing with that issue, we're actually damaging the entire body. We've got clear ways that we're supposed to communicate with each other. We need to try to do that. Because we need to understand that we're all in this together. And I'm not talking about some of the songs you've seen on Facebook during the COVID campaign. I'm saying we're actually in this together. Not just for now, but for all eternity. When we live without complaints and without bickering and without arguments, we also show something else very important to the world. We show them our God can be trusted. Because what we're saying to them is, listen, the God that I'm calling you to follow is the God that I'm following, and I'm going to tell you, he's done amazingly and abundantly beyond what I could have imagined. Hey, things aren't perfect, but I know he's in control and he's taking care of all of it. So I'm going to live without complaining and murmuring. Now listen, that's really easy to say, but I want to remind you again, grumbling is our native tongue. So it's something we have to be on guard against all the time. So, but the reason is because we're called to be lights in the world. We can't be lights if we're grumbling and complaining. But the other one he says is it looks like it's holding on to the word of life. And he says, why is it important that we hold on to the word of life? He says, holding fast to the word of life so that in the day of Christ, I may be proud that I did not run in vain or labor in vain. Paul says, listen, I want you to hold on to the word of life because someday Jesus is coming back and I want to stand before him and be able to say, those are people that I led to you. I want to be excited about the ministry that I had towards you. And so Paul is saying, listen, hold on to the word of life because I'm facing judgment, but there's, there's something we can expound from that, and that is this. We hold on to the word of life because someday we are going to stand before Jesus. Sometimes we forget that Jesus is coming back. Sometimes we live as though he's not coming back, but someday Jesus is coming back, and you know what? Every one of us is going to stand before him, and thank God that our salvation is secure, but when we stand before him, we are going to give an account for how we lived. I was thinking, do you guys remember back in school when you had exams? Now, if you were good students, you studied for them. I usually remembered them that morning. But could you imagine if you went into the exam and you opened up the exam and you realized you had studied the wrong chapter? You studied the wrong material? You hadn't prepared correctly? I'm afraid that's what a lot of believers are going to face on the day of Christ. Because we don't hold on to the word of life. We're going to stand before him and we're going to realize that, you know what? Rather than being able to say, I'm proud of the life that I lived, we're going to have to acknowledge, you know what? I missed a lot of areas because I allowed the world and the culture to direct my life more than I allowed the word of life to direct my life. We have to cling to the word of life because there is an exam coming. There's a time where we're going to stand before the Lord and the text that's going to guide us 
to ha hearing well done, good and faithful servant is the word of God and nothing else. By the way, it doesn't matter how popular we are with the world or how unpopular we are with the world. The only thing that matters is have we held on to the word of life. So with that said, what do we need to do? I'm going to give you a couple things just to, just to think about things that we need to do. First is this. Hopefully this will drive you to thank God for your salvation. Hopefully we can remove the idea that there's anything we have to earn, anything we have to work for. Instead, we just have to thank God for the grace that he showed us and the mercy that he's given to us in order to bring us to salvation through his son. So thank God for our salvation. The other thing is this. We need to check ourselves for a grumbling spirit. My prayer is like what happened with me as I was studying this text, that after hearing this text, when you leave here today, your spirit will be extra attuned to grumbling. And that you'll hear it and you'll put it in check. And by the way, one of the things to keep in mind, grumbling is not just what comes out of your mouth. It's what runs through your mind and it's what's living in your heart. So we have to be on guard against a grumbling spirit, understanding that we can't be the lights that God has called us to be if we're grumbling and complaining. Thirdly, we need, to, we need to hold on to the Word. Most of us here, we're on some sort of reading plan. We have a reading plan that um, we put out through the church. If you're, not, if you're not on a regular reading plan of the Scriptures, get a hold of that. That will guide you through reading the Bible and the Word in a year. Um, but get a hold of something where you're reading the Word. But here's the thing. Don't just read the Word. Actually apply it to our lives. We need to hold onto the word and we need to start examining our lives based not on whether or not the views we're holding are popular, but whether or not they line up with the word that God has given us. We've got to start examining our lives by whether or not the actions we're taking line up with the word of life. We've got to hold on to it in such a way that it becomes our guide in faith and practice and actually directs our lives day by day. And the final thing we need to do is we need to shine. Listen, we weren't put here to hide we weren't put here to memorize. We weren't put here to follow a list of rules. We were put here to be the lights of the world on behalf of Jesus Christ. When we get all that other stuff out of the way, we're in a position where we can shine a lot more. But listen, our job is to shine. It's not to be silent. So let's make sure that as we leave here today and as we're starting to see our jobs open up, we're starting to interact again with people, let's make sure that we're interacting in a way that shines his light to a world that needs to hear. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this day. We thank you for your word. We ask, Lord, that you'll just um, use this word in our hearts. Thank you, Lord, that we don't have to follow a whole list of rules. We have to follow you. Thank you, Lord, that we don't have to earn our salvation or even hold on to our salvation. We just trust you for the work that you've already done on our behalf. We ask, Lord, that you'll help us to live our lives without murmuring or complaining. We ask, Lord, that you'll guard our hearts and help us to do what's right so that we can truly shine, so that your church can light this world in a way that points people towards you and brings you glory and honor. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Thank you, praise team. Uh, let's close in a word of prayer. Dearly Father, we thank you again for your word. We thank you for your grace and mercy to us. We ask, Lord, now that as we leave here, you'll go with us, you'll guide us, and use us for your glory. And we thank you for each and every family that was able to tune in or to be here today. And we again ask that you'll be glorified in us. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.